Pandemics are nothing new for humanity. Our generation has recently experienced such a dangerous pandemic and have tasted of the fear it spreads in the hearts of people, but also of the death and devastation it brings about as millions were infected and hundreds of thousands died, many of them in close proximity to us. Today, we have a very advanced system of medical care, especially in the wealthier countries, with hospitals, doctors, and nurses trained to face such difficult challenges, who are also equipped with amazing technological devices to treat people and save lives. But that was not always the case. In the year 249 AD, in the world's most powerful empire, the Roman Empire. Mercy for the poor and sick was not easily found. Even the basic medical care available at that time was not available to those without means or influence. The sick and poor were usually ignored, scorned, or mostly abandoned. Very few Roman citizens felt any compassion for those in need. Doing so was often considered as the height of foolishness. But then, things began to change. Ironically, it was a catastrophic pandemic that became the catalyst of a spiritual, religious, medical, and social revolution that would forever transform the Roman way of life, ushering in the dawn of mercy. In the mid-3rd century AD, the mighty pagan Roman Empire was spanning three continents, many cultures, and was home to over 50 million people. It had the strongest military, it was the richest in resources, and the most technologically advanced empire on the planet. Yet, in 249 AD, a natural disaster would strike the empire with a frightening ferocity, and in a mere few months, the world's most advanced predatory empire would become the most helpless prey to an unseen enemy. People would be dying in the streets or in their homes, unable to escape the terrible plague. In the height of the irony, the empire, which worshipped strength and power, would be aided by a small, weak, and strange new religious group which prized humility, mercy, and selflessness. This new group, who was despised by the authorities, would be frequently targeted by the Roman officials for almost two centuries because it would not bow to the gods familiar to the Greco-Romans. Instead, it was proposing a Jewish man, whom the Romans killed on the cross, but whom his followers, known as Christians, worshipped as God. Claiming that he had risen from the dead and ascended to heaven. Mocked as a religion of women and the weak, Christianity was to shine at this critical moment of the history of the pagan Roman Empire. Not only were the Christians to help save Roman society from complete collapse, but their brave stance in the face of death and destruction would eventually outcompete the existing worldview of paganism and convert the Romans to the new philosophy of life proposed by Christ. Known by most modern historians as the Plague of Cyprian, the plague erupted in Ethiopia. In a matter of months, it spread to North Africa, Greece, Rome, and the Middle East, and would eventually infect the entire empire. Textual sources allow us to trace back to the time of the disease. One man's account in particular provides us with critical epidemiological data. His name was Cyprian. 
He was the Christian bishop in Carthage, North Africa, and his account of the plague's symptoms gives us vital clues regarding its pathology. As the strength of the body is dissolved, the bowels dissipate in a flow. A fire that begins in the inmost depths burns up into wounds in the throat. The intestines are shaken with continuous vomiting. The eyes are set on fire from the force of the blood. The infection of the deadly putrefaction cuts off the feet or other extremities of some. And as weakness prevails through the failures and losses of the bodies, the gait is crippled, or the hearing is blocked, or the vision is blinded. Another North African witness, likely a member of Bishop Cyprian's inner circle, emphasizes the sheer novelty of the pandemic. Do we not see the rites of death every day? Are we not witnessing strange forms of dying? Do we not behold disasters from some previously unknown kind of plague brought on by furious and prolonged diseases, and the massacre of wasted cities? What caused this horrific plague? Some modern experts have postulated that it was smallpox or influenza or an Ebola-like virus. Whatever the cause, the plague of Cyprian would attack the empire in waves for the next 15 to 20 years. At its peak, it would kill 5,000 people a day in Rome alone. It was in the midst of this horrific pandemic that the small and despised Christian community rose to unprecedented actions, which would far outstrip its diminutive size and impact the Roman society for centuries to come. Christians, heeding to the message of Christ to love their neighbors as themselves and serve the poor, the naked, the hungry, the thirsty, the prisoners and the downtrodden, as if serving the Lord himself, had lived and acted accordingly from early on. Christian communities, led by priests, deacons and deaconesses, cared for the members of the church who were poor and sick. By the third century, the local churches had already developed a very effective system for fulfilling the ever-expanding charitable work. In fact, in 3rd century Rome alone, it has been estimated that the small Christian community spent up to one million sesterces per year on helping the poor. That's approximately $1.7 million in today's money. So, when the plague of Cyprian struck, the Christian churches around the empire were ready and well prepared to take their philosophy of love and mercy as well as their economical and medical charity to a whole new level. As the pandemic unleashed hell, most people fled the cities to save themselves. The sick were abandoned. Piles of corpses were left to rot in the streets. But the Christians would do something no other group of people had ever done before. They would remain in the cities and go out into the streets searching for the sick and dying. No one, Christian or non-Christian, was to be left behind. They would care for those still alive and give proper burials to those who died. There was a price to pay, however, for these acts of love and philanthropy. Dionysius, Bishop of Alexandria in Egypt, tells us that the best of our brothers succumb to the disease while placing themselves in harm's way. Unfortunately, this was not the only price Christians had to pay. While enduring the horrors of the plague, they also had to endure persecution by the Roman authorities. Deep-seated in the pagan religion 
was the belief that calamities, such as plagues, were the retribution of the gods for human unbelief and dishonor to the gods. And when the plague hit, Roman authorities turned their wrath toward the Christians who refused to worship the gods. This is the time of the numerous martyrs among the unmercenary Christian healers, many of whom are still remembered by the church, as they also witnessed their faith in the face of persecution and shed their blood, refusing to deny Christ. Some names stand out. Cosmas and Damianos, Kiros and Ioannis, Pandeleimon and Ermolaos, Nikitas and Diomidis, and many others. In the autumn of 249 AD, Emperor Decius arrested senior members of the Christian clergy. A few months later, he proclaimed that everyone, except for the Jews, were to offer sacrifices to the gods on pain of death. This was a difficult and perilous time for Christians. Some of them would remain true to their faith, others would falter. In the midst of the killer pandemic, Christians were now also dying at the hands of the pagans. Yet, Bishop Cyprian would call upon the Christian community to offer help even to their persecutors. There is nothing remarkable in cherishing merely our own people with the due attention of love, but that one might become perfect who should do something more than heathen men or publicans, one who, overcoming evil with good and practicing a merciful kindness like that of God, should love his enemies as well, Thus, mercy and compassion was shown to all people, not merely to the household of faith. The efforts of Christians, their sacrifice for others, and their bravery in the face of death, even as they were being persecuted, would not go unnoticed. The people of the Roman Empire began to embrace the new philosophy presented by Christians in greater numbers. Historians estimate that the number of Christians grew at least fivefold between 250 and 300 AD, rising from about 2% of the population of the empire to more than 10%. In the next 50 years, the conversion of pagans to Christianity would further accelerate, aided by several other factors, while at the core of the attraction to this new religion was the experience of mercy and love, an unprecedented phenomenon in the history of the Greco-Roman world. The memory of the plague had not yet diminished when in the year 312 AD, another pandemic would strike the empire. Church historian Eusebius writes, It was the winter season, and usual rains were withholding their normal downpour. When without warning, famine struck, followed by an outbreak of a different disease, malignant pustule. This spread over the entire body, causing great danger to the sufferers. But the eyes were the chief target for attack, and hundreds of men, women, and children lost their sight through it. Hundreds were dying in the cities, still more in the country villages, so that the rural registers, which once contained so many names, now suffered almost complete obliteration. Once again, the Christians would be the only ones to provide care for the sick and dying, during what was most likely an outbreak of smallpox. And it was the Christians who would bury the dead. The historian Eusebius writes, All day long, some continued without rest to tend to the dying and bury them. The number was immense, and there was no one to see to them. 
The very same year, after nearly 300 years of caring for the Empire's poor, sick, and dead, Christianity would finally reap its first major temporal reward, the conversion of Emperor Constantine. A watershed moment in Western civilization, one that would lead to the first healthcare and welfare model wholly operated by the Christian Church. In the 320s, Emperor Constantine would partner with the Church to establish several distinct charitable institutions, hostels for travelers, orphanages for foundlings, rest homes for the elderly, and almshouses for the poor. And in 324, an Egyptian monk named Pachomios would create the empire's first monastic infirmary, a proto-hospital, so to speak, which featured medical care and professional attendance. While basic palliative care had long been a staple of early Christian healthcare, professional medical treatment would make rapid strides soon after Constantine legalized Christianity. Research shows that from the 1st to the 3rd centuries, the number of Christian physicians steadily grows. Then, there is a pronounced jump in the 4th century. This new pool of Christian physicians would offer the now Christian empire the best of both worlds. A strong commitment to Christian philanthropia and the application of generally accepted Greco-Roman medicine albeit one that was now offering a holistic approach to healing, addressing both body and soul, the healing of the whole Anthropos. Again, in the year 369 AD, a severe famine would strike a region of the Eastern Roman Empire called Cappadocia in Asia Minor. Bishop Basil, a highly educated monk and renowned rhetorician, immediately organizes the equivalent of a soup kitchen to feed the starving people. He wasn't satisfied with this service alone, however, so he put his renowned oratory as well as his organizational skills to work. While utilizing his own personal and family resources, he also invited the wealthy of his district to join in and put together something far greater. Three years later, the world would have its first official hospital. This amazing institution was aptly named the Basilius, after its founder. So magnificent was this new institution that fellow Bishop Gregory the Theologian, a friend of Bishop Basil, compared it to the ancient wonders of the world. Go forth and live away from the city, and behold the new city, the storehouse of piety, the common treasury of the wealthy where disease is regarded in a religious light and disaster is thought a blessing and sympathy is put to the test. And according to Gregory, Bishop Basil was not afraid to get his hands dirty. Basil took the lead in pressing upon those who were men that they ought not to despise their fellowmen. Others have had their cooks and splendid tables, and the devices and dainties of confectionaries, and exquisite carriages and soft flowing robes. Basil's care was for the sick, and the relief of their wounds, and the imitation of Christ, by cleansing leprosy not by a word, but in deed. St. Basil's Basilius employed a live-in medical staff which provided medical care in the scientifically acceptable Greco-Roman tradition, and it even offered vocational training so those recovering from their illness could get back on their feet financially as well. The Basilius would soon inspire an explosion in the establishment of hospitals throughout the eastern part of the Roman Empire. In the more tumultuous West, however, the first hospital would not rise until 20 years later, thanks to a woman named Fabiola, who belonged to a famous Roman patrician family. She was married to an abusive man who made her life miserable, 
but was able to get out of it. After obtaining a civil divorce, she entered into a second marriage. While her first husband was still alive, contrary to the church's teaching. Soon after, after her second husband had died, on the day before Pascha, she dressed in penitential garb and appeared before the gates of the Lateran Basilica in Rome. The Bishop of Rome quickly received her back into full communion with the church. Fabiola, putting her penance into action, henceforth devoted her immense wealth to the care of the poor and sick. In the year 390 AD, she would independently fund construction of Rome's first public hospital. And according to St. Jerome, the hospital's fame reached as far as Parthia and Britain within the year. And like St. Basil, she would personally tend to the poor and sick even to those with loathsome diseases. In the meantime, by the time Fabiola founded her hospital, Christianity was fast approaching 60% of the empire's population. By this time, many inner city parishes had established philanthropic services for widows and orphans run exclusively by the deaconesses. One such example was the city of Antioch, where St. John Chrysostom was leading the philanthropic work of the church during his diaconate, assisted by hundreds of widows and deaconesses. Even monastic communities followed the example of St. Basil and Fabiola, attaching hostels and hospitals to their structures and serving those in need. The late classical scholar E. R. Dodds points out that Love of one's neighbor is not an exclusively Christian virtue. But in the late antique Roman period, the Christians appeared to have practiced it much more effectively than any other group. The church provided the essentials of social security. It cared for widows and orphans, the old, the unemployed, and the disabled. It provided a burial fund for the poor and a nursing service in time of plague. The Yale University professor Kenneth Latourette writes, More than any other power in history, Christianity has impelled men to fight suffering. It has built thousands of hospitals, inspired the emergence of the nursing and medical professions, and furthered the movement for public health and the relief and prevention of famine. The list might go on indefinitely. Christ's message and example of love for the neighbor has offered the guidance and inspiration to his followers to innovate and transform society through institutions of mercy and compassion, providing at the same time a model for everyone to follow. May Christ's mercy and compassion especially as applied by the early Christians, abide in our broken world today, as well as in the years to come. <laughs>